Well, here's the story of Jesus' mountaintop experience that comes to us in the middle of Matthew's Gospel. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here, and if you wish, I will make three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And while he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud a voice said, This is my Son, the Beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Get up and do not be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus himself all alone. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, Tell no one about the vision until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. Here ends the reading. Will you pray with me? Holy One, we would walk up the mountain of your grace. We would sit at the top and enjoy the view. Come to your people now. Come now and speak through our words and our meditations. Come now and send us into our world with renewed vision. Holy One, bless us that we may be a blessing to others by what we say and do in this moment. Amen. I began to think about this passage, and I began to think about the tallest mountain I had ever been on top of. I began to think how it is that you get up a mountain. Now, I come from Colorado. We have mountains in Colorado. Now, it's not that the mountains of West Virginia are not equally beautiful and stunning in their incredible variety of life, or that the mountains of, of the Southwest in their, in their vermilion austerity are not just as stunning. But in Colorado, we have the mountains of my heart impressed onto the very formation of my childhood is a particular shape and size of rock and stone. And while I stand on other mountains and I go to other places, it is when I go home to the mountains that shaped me that I am once again shaped by them. Wherever your mountains are, I invite you to just simply find that place in your mind's eye. Find the mountain that knows you best. Those places that elevate us play a critical role in how we are able to be the people we are. In my life, those mountains represented time with my parents, who dragged me, often kicking and screaming, up the side of many a mountain trail. Those mountains remind me, both in snow and in spring, of of both of my parents trying to teach me of a wider vision, something bigger than myself. And there is an irreducibility about mountaintops. You cannot argue with a mountain. Not and win, my father said. If the lightning comes and the snow descends and you are halfway up or maybe just at the verge of the top of the mountain, the mountain wins. You must go down. If it is not your day, it is not your day. And the mountain persists. Another time you can return to catch the view, but if it is not your time, then you are no match for millions of years of orogenic grace. But 
when it is your day. When, through a combination of sheer grit, you have climbed your way past the place where most flatlanders can no longer breathe, and you find yourself well beyond the place where most trees can grow, and the pink granite has given way to the gray basalt. And you find yourself up there, and there is enough sun and no clouds, and you can see literally for a thousand miles. In that day, you know what the disciples knew then. In that day, you know what it is to see and be seen in a way you can't do on the ground, either the ground floor of the forest floor or the ground of your everyday life sometimes. Isn't it true that we, we are surrounded by beauty as much, maybe even more, visual beauty when we are in the midst of a dense undergrowth, but sometimes we do not permit ourselves to see it? We cannot admit or readmit our own beloved nature and the nature that surrounds us. It is sometimes when we get above it and away from it that we can finally appreciate it. Why is that? A certain perversity of human nature, I think. That which we want most, we cannot appreciate it until it is furthest from us. Was that Jesus? Was that Jesus in this moment? The work that he'd been doing, the preaching he'd been doing, the healing he'd been trying out, the, the gathering of disciples trying to inculcate in them a sense of what was important and more important than their, even their everyday work, their everyday relationships. Was that just so hard? Was it just so much work? They go up to the top of the mountain. He takes with them the close ones. They get up there to what? To, to get away, to pray, to hold on, to see something new? Oh, we don't know. But up there, the vision that comes is a reminder of the work that is below. It's the, the upside of the downside work, right? Down below are the people, down below are the disciples, down below are the troubles and the trials and the diseases, the political intrigues. Down below is the valley of the shadow of death. We always preach on transfiguration right before Lent, the six weeks that lead us to Easter. But before Easter, in that veil, there is Golgotha. Did Jesus standing on this mountain look down the Jordan Valley to Mount Calvary? Did Jesus standing on this mountain Remember Moses on Mount Nebo, looking in but never permitted to enter the promised land. Did he, with Elijah, worry for the fate of those who lived in the dry and hot valleys below? Jesus calls us up the mountain at this time of year to ask us those very same questions. What do you love so much that you would be willing to lay down your life for it? Those people, those principles, what do you love so much that you would be willing to go up onto this mountain to remember how much it matters so that when you go down, you can lift up those who are underneath? If there is an upside of being in that valley of the shadow of death, if there is an upside to knowing just how ill or how twisted or how broken you or members of your family or the world at large may seem, the upside is this. It is a reminder to us to not pretend that we are not ill or broken or twisted. C.S. Lewis famously says in his Paralandra trilogy, in the, in the Out of the Silent Planet trilogy there, that the most dangerous people are not the broken people who know their ailments and who know that they are wounded, 
but rather the most dangerous to this world and to themselves are the bent people. Those who are twisted but pretend that they are right and right with God. It is the bent. It is when we are bent, bent out of shape, twisting the world around us so that we appear straight, that we appear correct, that we do the most serious damage to others. It is no accident that in AA meetings that the first reminder to self is that we are where we are because of who we are. It is no accident that it, you cannot get better until you go to the doctor and say, I am ill. So one of the downsides of being sick is being in the dumps, but being the upsides of the downside is that if you know you are ill, that is the first step to getting help. Jesus, who may have seen the ills of this world more clearly than any of us, calls us to the mountain to see where we truly are and to remind us of what is truly beloved. Your heart, twisted or broken as it may feel, is beloved. The vision you have and are holding dear of people in your life at peace is beloved. The hope, the hope of nations beating their swords into plowshares is then, is now, and will be beloved of God. And if we have lost sight of it in the undergrowth of everyday events, Jesus calls us to the mountain so that we can look down again and see that there are no borders, no matter how many walls we build. Why do the nations conspire? And why do the peoples plot in vain, the psalmist says? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers to take counsel together against the Lord, against the Lord's vision. So, maybe Jesus is called up to remind us. Maybe Jesus is called up to remind the disciples. But maybe all of us are invited to take a new perspective, to see again those things worth laying down for, worth putting ourselves in the way of it, worth lifting those who may not yet be able to climb. This week, this month, this year, much will be demanded of people of faith. Many words will come to you. Many words will be thrown at us. Many words will be spoken in your name that you will not recognize. And we who seek the beloved peace of God who calls each person beloved will need to know the upside of being down. We will need to tap into the greater vision that we hold from those things we know are lovely. And we will, with hope and with courage, I pray, go down this mountain to tell the story of that vision because the Son of Man already has been lifted up. While we are entering in a commemoration of Lent, my friends, we are already in the resurrection. We ourselves are not in the valley of the shadow of death. We ourselves have been to the mountain. We know what it is to offer grace and peace. We know what it is when straight and gay live together. We know what it looks like when peoples of all colors, of all skin tones, know what it is. We know what it is when they work together and build love and hope and societies of grace of freedom, of law, of fairness, of justice. We know what that looks like. It is beloved of us. We have seen it from the mountaintops, the pinnacles we have entered and climbed only rarely, but we can never forget them. We will never release them from our hearts. And when we are up and we go down, it is never to stay down. Those who hate will knock over the cemeteries of those who love. Those who hate 
will try to enact laws to punish those who care. Those who despise will seek out those who are most loving and they will cause them pain. But we who have been to the mountain will neither be silent nor silenced. Those who mistake the gospel for punishment miss Jesus and pervert his word. But those who walk to the top, even to catch a glimpse of the bottom, to them Jesus grants peace and power. I have climbed many mountains. I have walked up and gasped for breath in cold air that would stab your lungs and sting your eyes. But the mountain I want to climb is the one where you are so that I can know what you know is beloved. The upside is that we get to go down and tell the story of a much higher love in all of the very low moments. Don't get weary, children. Don't you ever get weary. I've been to the mountain. I have been to the mountain with you. Amen.